Mark chapter 10. I did it again. Mark chapter 10. I appreciate you turning your Bible there. I appreciate so much you follow along uh, in uh, this week, the last few days as uh, we have looked into God's Word. I appreciate so much your interest in spiritual things and your desire to hear God's Word proclaimed and your uh, just encouragement that you have given me. I appreciate so much the encouragement and just being here and the way that you've worshiped and I appreciate the song leaders and the songs that you've led this week. They have been uh, really, really wonderful and uplifting, and uh, I just appreciate your faith so much, and thank you again for the invitation to be here. In the 1950s, Parker Brothers came out with a game that was titled Going to Jerusalem. And Going to Jerusalem was different from uh, Parker Brothers' game Monopoly, You weren't a little Scotty dog or a a car or a top hat, but you were a a little man in a robe with sandals and a beard and a staff. And in this game, to advance along the board, there was this little, little New Testament, and you would receive a question, and you would have to answer that question correctly, and you'd look it up in the New Testament, see if it was, see if it was right. And the interesting thing about going to Jerusalem was that in the board game, you always stopped in Bethlehem, but you made various stops in, in, in Nazareth or Bethsaida or, or Capernaum, or you might find yourself in the Mount of Olives or, or Bethany. And if you rolled the dice really well, you went all the way to the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But the thing is about that game is that you never got to the crucifixion and you never got to the resurrection. There were no demon-possessed men. There were no angry Pharisees. You only made your way through the nice stories. It was a safe adventure. Seemed like a game that was perfectly suited for a Christian family on a Sunday afternoon. But I'll tell you tonight that traveling with Jesus wasn't meant for plastic disciples who just simply look up verses in a little Bible. But if you're going to walk with Jesus... And if you're going to follow him and be a disciple in this world, you might need to change your expectations. After all, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And so as we begin tonight, I want to ask you a question. Are you ready to follow a cross-carrying Christ? You see, as we're in the book of, of, of Mark, I believe that Mark wrote to us to get us on the road to Jerusalem to get us on the road to discipleship. In other words, I believe Mark wrote this gospel to get us on the road to a cross. And I want to look at this kind of discipleship tonight, of what it means to follow Jesus and the challenges that come along with it. But I want to begin here in Mark chapter 10. And notice in verse 46, it says, as, And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you and throwing off his cloak. He sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. I want us, as we begin tonight, to consider this miracle of Bartimaeus. When we think about this man named Bartimaeus, we learn quickly that he's blind and he's a beggar. And of course, in this time that he's living, there's not very many white-collar jobs. And so because of his disability and he's unable to see, of course, he has been reduced to becoming a beggar. And if you're, if you're a beggar, well, you would learn where the best place is to go to, to get the most uh, the, the most money that you could. And, and you would find out in those times where there would be many people traveling on a particular road. And so I believe that Bartimaeus knew that this was the place to be at this time. 
It's easy to spot these places in Jerusalem. There are, of course, three annual feasts, the Passover being the biggest one. And the Jews from all over would come to Jerusalem and celebrate. And so the highways were particularly crowded three times a year. And this would be one of those times. And the the Jews believe that if you're on the road to the temple, well, that is a time that God would likely notice if you did something good. Uh, a God, they thought that God watched a lot more here as he, they are traveling to Jerusalem to worship him. And I wonder if we might convince ourselves of that as well. We get all dressed up and we go to church and we think, well, God is especially watching me now and not give any consideration to the fact that he watches us on Tuesday as much as he watches us on Sunday or Wednesday. But you think about blind Bartimaeus. Beggars were like billboards. A bunch of them were around and no one really paid attention to them. And for Bartimaeus, no one really respected him. And I think that's revealed in how the crowd just kind of tried to silence Bartimaeus and tell him to be quiet. They rebuked him. Why would this rabbi stop to talk to a blind man? But you'll notice in this story that nothing can deter Bartimaeus. He would not be dissuaded from crying out to God because he to Christ because he had confidence in him. And I think that's part of having faith. Part of having faith means believing Christ can make you what you are supposed to be, what you are meant to be. And this blind man believed that God did not mean for him to be blind, but that God had something better for him. And because of that, when he had this moment for Jesus of Nazareth, nothing would stop him from getting the attention of Jesus. So nothing can deter Bartimaeus, but also we see nothing can deter Jesus. Jesus stops for a needy man who is crying out for mercy. Now, Jesus is determined to go to Jerusalem, but he's going to slow down long enough to have a conversation with a blind man who is calling out for him. And Jesus says, call him. And I think that just shows you the importance of one person to Jesus. I'm just thinking about something Jesus said in John chapter 6, in verse 37. He says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I don't care who they are or what they are. Jesus says, I will never drive anyone that comes to me away. And so you'll notice in the story in verse 49, when Jesus says, call him, they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up. And I was, we can't believe it, but you should be excited. Take heart, get up. He is calling you. And I love his eagerness in verse 50. It says, and throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. I love his eagerness because in the gospels and other places, I'm thinking of Luke chapter 9, There are others who would come to Jesus, but they want to make excuses of why they couldn't follow Jesus at that moment. Someone said, well, let me first go bury my father. Or another person said, well, let me go home and and say goodbye to my family. They might want to throw me a, a going away party. But Bartimaeus here was not going to make any excuses. He jumped to his feet. He threw his cloak aside, and Jesus sees how eager he is to come to him that nothing is going to stop him for asking for mercy. And so in verse 51, Jesus asked the question, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Or your version may say, your faith has made you whole. And another way that you can say that is Jesus says, he he goes on to say, go your way, your faith has saved you. You see, Bartimaeus at this moment has been healed physically, but spiritually as well. And I wonder what happened to Bartimaeus. I mean, we read in this story that he followed Jesus on the way. I wonder what happened to him. I like to try to think the best of the best of people. And I want to think the best of of Bartimaeus. I like to imagine that that he was a a strong encourager in the church. I I like to think that maybe when this gospel was being read, there was someone who said, yeah, you know, I've heard Bartimaeus tell this story before. But why is this miracle placed right here 
in the Gospel of Mark because it's interesting to note that this is the final miracle in the Gospel of Mark. That right here, this is it. And so it's interesting that Jesus doesn't try after this miracle to conceal his identity. Because as you read through the Gospel of Mark, that's what he's done. But this time he doesn't try to conceal his identity because it's time for his followers and for us as readers of this Gospel to make a decision of whether or not we too are going to follow Jesus on the way. You know, in some sense, in the Gospel of Mark, everyone suffers from some degree of blindness. It's interesting, the Gospel of Mark, only those who knew his identity were the demons. (laughs) The demons knew, but remember, Jesus wouldn't let them speak. Others thought they knew who Jesus was, but they were blind because they didn't see Jesus as they should. And I want to show you how, I think Mark makes that point. If you go back a few chapters in your Bible to Mark chapter 8, to Mark chapter 8, you see how Mark is trying to take the blindness away and show who Jesus really is. And you'll notice in Mark chapter 8, um, Jesus teaches them and tells them to watch out, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, and they're not so sure about what Jesus is saying. And so you can read in, in verse 18, Jesus says, I'm sorry, in verse 17, he says, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? And so Jesus is, is teaching them. He's trying to open up their eyes and open up their hearts as well. And he says in verse 21, do you not yet understand? And I think it's at this point in time where Mark, he's going to say, I'm going to take away your blindness. I'm going to show who Jesus is and what it means for us. Because notice in verse 22, they came to Bethsaida and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, Jesus said to him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored and saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. But do you notice that Jesus heals this blind man in stages? This is a unique miracle, not in the sense that he was blind, but in the sense that Jesus touched him and he says, yeah, I see a little bit, but, but they look like trees. We might be puzzled by that. We'll think, well, did, did Jesus just have a long day and, and, and did he just run out of power at that, at, at that moment? No, that's not the case, of course. I think this represents where the disciples are. They see Jesus with fuzzy eyes as well. They think they see him and they know him, but they need to get Jesus into focus. And so in verse 27 of chapter 8, this is when Jesus asked his disciples, he said, look, you've been following me now for for some time. He says, who do people say that I am? Some say John the Baptist, Elijah, others one of the prophets. And he says, but who do you say that I am? And this is where Peter says, you are the Christ. And Peter hits it out of the park here at this moment when he says, you are the Christ, and we think Peter knows. We might have known the right answer, but he didn't have the correct definition. Because when Peter says, you are the Christ, he's not seeing the Christ on the cross and risen from the dead. He's seeing Jesus as this great leader and he's going to come and and conquer Rome and and put Israel back in her rightful place. When Peter left his fishing business, he wasn't expecting to just be a preacher for the rest of his life. When he followed Jesus, he thought he was going to be a fighter. He was going to help them get their land back. And so when he says, you are the Christ, he's not seeing Jesus clearly here. Now, in verse 30, it says he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And I think that's because Jesus didn't want half-truths spread about him. And if he, had, if he would have allowed this, well, they would have gone through and just shouted, let's fight, let's go. But in verse 31, for the first time, Jesus plainly tells them what's going to happen. It says, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things 
and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So he is trying to get them into focus with who he is. Let them recover their sight. And I think you'll see here that as he was healed, this blind man was healed in stages. The disciples too are out of focus. They're they're trying to to see Jesus clearly as Mark is demonstrating here. And now at this moment, there is this shift from the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. That's true. That's revealed. But now what's the meaning behind that? And Jesus being the Messiah means that he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to be killed. And Mark says you don't understand the Messiah unless you understand the cross. And so the last few chapters, Mark, uh, in chapter 8, in chapter 9, in chapter 10, you start to see this pattern that emerges here that Mark will say that they're going to such and such a place and then Jesus tells them that he's going to Jerusalem to suffer and to be killed. And then it always follows up with some error by the disciples. This is in Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus tells them plainly. But remember that Peter took him aside and Peter rebuked him. Far be it from you, Lord. This should never happen to you. Peter didn't get it. And then in Mark chapter 9, in Mark chapter 9, verse 31, Jesus says the, the very same thing that we read in Mark chapter 8. And it's right after this that Jesus tells them that he's going to Jerusalem to be killed. It's right after this that they begin arguing about who is the greatest. And then the third time that Jesus tells them plainly about his death is in chapter 10 at verse 33. And in chapter 10 at verse 33, he says the very same thing, that the Son of Man is going to be delivered over to the chief priest. He's going to be killed. And then notice what happens next again. This time, for the third time, There's some error here. Remember James and John, they come up to Jesus and they want the best positions in the cabinet. They want to be right by Jesus in his kingdom. And all three times, I think it shows us that they're still not getting it. And so Jesus, every time, follows up this error with the truth about what it means to be his disciple. And it didn't really set well with them. And at times it doesn't set well today. Here they wanted to be high up in the kingdom. And he keeps talking about how he's going to be killed and how he wants us to die to ourselves. But that's Mark's point, I think, in this gospel. That when you call Jesus Lord and Christ, you don't get to define what that means. A disciple does not form his teacher. He follows his teacher. And I think that's why Mark started this whole section the way he starts it in chapter 8 with healing of a blind man who ends up seeing completely. And then Mark chapter 10, Bartimaeus, he has his sight restored. And think about the kind of the comparisons and the contrast with Bartimaeus and, and what we've seen. Bartimaeus knows that he's blind, but but the disciples don't. Bartimaeus approaches Jesus on the basis of mercy. We could look at Mark chapter 10 and see that there is a man, the rich young man, of course, he comes to Jesus and he approaches Jesus based upon his goodness. In Mark chapter 10, the disciples rebuke the little children as, as not being important enough to come to Jesus. And the people end up rebuking Bartimaeus as well. The very same word. The disciples rebuked and they rebuked Bartimaeus for not being important enough to come to him. And then Jesus asked the very same question to James and John that he asked Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? But Bartimaeus reveals to us what genuine discipleship looks like. First of all, genuine discipleship shows us from Bartimaeus that he had the right identity. Remember Bartimaeus cried out, son of David. That's a messianic title there. He is saying, Jesus, you are the Christ. So he has the right identity. He also made a personal decision, something that's easy to miss in verse 51. But when Jesus asked him the question, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, rabbi, 
But this is actually an instance when the word Rabboni is used. And, and what he is saying here is he is saying, my master or my teacher, here's what I want you to do for me. The only other time that word is used in scripture is by Mary after his resurrection. But he, he, he makes a decision that he is going to Jesus and he is seeking healing. And then, of course, as we've noticed, he follows Jesus on the way. He followed Jesus on the way. Every time Mark talks about Jesus or going to Jerusalem, he's talking about Jesus going on his way. And when it says that Bartimaeus followed Jesus on that way, think about what that means. That Bartimaeus has now become a pilgrim and he follows the Lord to the cross. And I think that this is what this text is really forcing us to make a decision on as well. Will we follow Jesus on the way? But before we do that, before we make this decision to get up and follow Jesus on his way, there are some things we have to understand. And let me just review a few of them with you tonight. I think we can look in the Gospel of Mark and see there are some things that if we're going to follow Jesus, I want to point out to you just a few things tonight that it requires. First of all, to follow Jesus, we have to renounce self. You'll notice back in Mark chapter 9, back in Mark chapter 9, I want you to notice in verse, Mark chapter 9, and you'll know, I'm sorry, uh, Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8 at verse 34. Just notice the words of Jesus. This is after he tells his Disciples, what is going to happen when he goes to Jerusalem? He tells them in verse 34, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's the very first thing that, that Jesus says about discipleship. If you're going to follow after me, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That is the heart of discipleship. This is the very core of Christianity. And what doesn't that go against the culture that we live in? To deny self? When we live in a world that says, God just wants me to be happy. Seek whatever pleasure, seek whatever relationship, seek whatever thrill that you can find, and don't worry about anybody else. Just look out for number one. And there's a lot of people who live that way. But when Jesus comes along and what he teaches about discipleship is that you have to reorient your way of thinking about yourself. Jesus says, deny self. And sometimes I think we add, we add something to that and say, well, Jesus says, deny yourself things. Jesus doesn't say things. Sometimes we say, well, you know, I, I gave up this or I gave up cussing and I, I, I became a Christian. Well, Jesus didn't say deny yourself things. He simply says deny self. We're not talking about just giving up some things in your life. Now, that's going to be included in that. But before you get to that, you have to give up any claim that you have to yourself and to your life. And that's difficult for us to do because there's lots of selves, I think, in our lives. I always picture it kind of as a, as a boardroom. You go into a boardroom or a big meeting room, you've got all of these leather chairs, right? This long rectangular table. And when it comes to, to our hearts, at times we might have one of these big boardroom tables with all of these chairs. And in these chairs are all of these selves. You've got the financial self, you've got your relational self, you've got your entertainment self, you've got your religion self, you've got your recreational self, all of these things. And everybody's sitting around this table in my heart. And all of these selves, they want to say, they want to be heard, they want a seat at the table. And then Jesus comes along and he says, I want your life. And we think, well, let me pull up another chair. It, you scoot over. Let, let me put Jesus here in a chair as well. And the problem is, is when you just add Jesus to the table, things get really complicated. Because when you add Jesus to the conference table, you begin to think, well, hold on just a second. I've given a recreational self or financial self a little bit of time this week. Let me hear what Jesus has to say. Let me throw him a bone. Let me try to please him for just a moment. 
Jesus doesn't want a seat at the table. He wants the table burned. He wants it destroyed. He wants to be on the throne of our hearts. And the only way that's ever going to happen is if we make the choice to deny ourselves and live our lives simply to be pleasing to Him. So first of all, we have to renounce self. Second of all, we have to release riches. Go back to Mark chapter 10. Go over to Mark chapter 10. I mentioned a moment ago the story of, of the rich young man, of the rich young ruler. Remember, he comes to Jesus and he wants to know, what, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him the commands under the law that he's living. And, and he tells him, well, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. And Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But notice what it says next. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. This man had a grip on everything that he owned and he wasn't willing to let it go. He was so focused on his possessions that he missed what he would have gained if he would have just released it all. Because you notice what Jesus says. Go sell all your possessions and give it to the poor and then come follow me. You see, if you release your riches and your possessions, what you get is Jesus. And that's far greater than anything this world has to offer. And then notice in verse 25, Jesus says, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Why is that? What can be the case? that wealth can destroy a couple of, of qualities that are absolutely essential when it comes to discipleship. First of all, it can destroy our willingness to trust. Because to be a disciple, you must willingly trust God. You must trust Him for everything. And at times, maybe for a rich man, it's hard to say, why would I trust God when I have this huge bank account to fall back? It can destroy our willingness to trust. It can also destroy our willingness to receive. Because you'll know it, in Mark chapter 10, at verse 15, Jesus says this when, uh, when the children come to him. In verse 15, he says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And I'll tell you, a child, they don't come to you with a fistful of possessions and money. They come to you with open hands. <laughs> They don't have anything to offer. They want to receive. And Jesus says, we've got to be willing to release that. He would say in Luke chapter 14 at verse 33, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And discipleship understands the principle that Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 6. He teaches it in Luke chapter 16 at the end of that chapter where he says, you cannot serve God and money. You can't do it. Now, he doesn't say you can't have money and God. He doesn't say that. He says you cannot serve God and money. And if you choose to serve and worship the God of money, you will eventually be very disappointed because all it takes is for one crash, one individual that can take it all away in a moment's notice. But as Christians, we release our riches. We understand what Paul teaches in 1 Timothy chapter 6, that we came into this world with nothing and we'll leave with nothing. What we have are simply the blessings that God has entrusted us with. And we keep a loose grip on those things if we're going to follow Jesus on the way. But then finally, we need to reject worldly values. And I'm sorry, I got two more. We need to reject worldly values. You know, discipleship is radical. It goes against the grain of culture. What Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount is completely radical to what the world says the way we ought to live. And if we're going to follow Jesus on the way, it means we ought to value what He values. I've just heard some things recently about marriage in the world that many say, you know, marriage is outdated. It's not something that's really all that important or valuable today. And, and there was a quote by an actress by the name of Scarlett Johansson that I thought was interesting. She, she separated from her second husband. 
And she expressed some doubts about marriage. She says, I think the idea is romantic. It's a beautiful idea. But she says, I don't think it's natural to be a monogamous person. It's a lot of work. You see, the world doesn't value the marriage bond. But for a disciple, it means we're going to take it seriously and understand what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, that what God has joined together, let no man separate. You see, as we follow Jesus on the way, we reject worldly values. We reject sin and what sin has to offer. And we're willing to make radical decisions in our life to avoid sin. We take sin seriously. Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, at verse 43, he, or he says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we take his values seriously. It'll change your way of thinking. And then finally, well, I didn't put it on there, but I got one more. <laughs> we need to replace our ambitions with service. He says this, just one more passage I want to show you. In verse 35, he says this in Mark chapter 9, when the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest. He says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. If we're a disciple of Jesus, it means that we don't live our lives to be served, but to serve others, just as Jesus said was the reason that he came in verse 45 of chapter 10. That's discipleship, that we do not belong to ourselves, but we belong to God, and we are meant to serve others for the sake of Jesus. You know, the people who, who want to find Jesus on their own terms, they'll only go so far. Because once they see Jesus heading to Jerusalem to the cross, that's the more they begin to resist them. But I'll tell you, there is no such thing as dying part-time or dying half the way. Either you die or you don't. Either you are a disciple of Jesus or you're not. You cannot stop at Jericho. But as a disciple, you must follow Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. And that trip is really the message of the gospel. Are you willing to go to Jerusalem with Jesus? And will you follow him? And it could be that you're here tonight and you need to get on that road. You need to make the decision to renounce yourself, to release riches, to reject the world's values, and to become a servant for God. And if you'll do that, you can follow Jesus on the way. It's a way that is filled with suffering. It's a way that is filled with great joy. Because ultimately, as a disciple, we have a hope of heaven and spending eternity with our Creator. If we can help you make that decision, to follow Jesus on the way tonight by obeying the gospel. Let us know while we stand and sing.